Chapter 8. Name, Capricorn Anderson. I really missed Rain. My whole life, whenever I got confused, there she'd be to explain it all to me. One time, I remember, we were in Rutherford, laying in a supply of tofu. We grew our own fruits and vegetables at Garland, but everything else had to be brought in from outside. Then we stopped at the hardware store to stock up on duct tape, which was just about the most useful thing on earth for a farm commune. It repaired roofs, walls, pipes, cars, furniture, and boots. At least a quarter of Garland was held together with the stuff. It made an instant cast for a broken finger and even pulled splinters out of your skin. Before I was born, when there were lots of young children growing up in the community, all those diapers used to be fastened by squares of duct tape. But when we got to the store, there was a group of people blocking the entrance. They were carrying signs and chanting. They seemed to be really angry about something. Rain explained that the employees were on strike, standing up for fair treatment. She thought it was an excellent idea. She refused to cross the picket line, so we drove 20 miles out of her way to buy her duct tape. We came back, though, and marched with the strikers for a couple of hours. Rain even let me unscrew the knobs to let the air out of the tires of the boss's car. Rain said the trip was the purest form of education, learning by doing. I sure could have used that kind of wisdom now, with so much going on in my life and so many things I didn't understand. Like bullfighting. I asked Mrs. Donnelly about it, but the subject really seemed to bother her. She advised me to ignore anyone who mentioned it again, so I looked it up in the encyclopedia, and I figured out why Mrs. Donnelly was so upset. Bullfighting is a cruel sport where innocent animals are tormented, tortured, killed, and have their ears cut off. I needed Rain more than ever to ask her why a school would have anything to do with that, but she was out of the picture. This was a decision I would have to make on my own, and I did. The next time I saw Zach Powers, I put my foot down. I'm not going to ask Mr. Kasigi about bullfighting anymore. I object to it on moral grounds. He said, I respect your honesty, and shook my hand as he walked away. I noticed his shoulders shaking, overcome with emotion, I guess. I was beginning to see that growing up knowing only one other person had some serious disadvantages. Without Rain as my mentor and guide, I was lost. The school made me dizzy. I spent half my time wandering the hills, asking people directions to rooms they'd never heard of. Students were constantly peppering me with questions I didn't have the answer to. And now a girl named Lorelei Lumley was writing me notes about how she'd love to run her fingers through my hair. Why would anybody want to do that? The closest thing I had to Rain was Hugh Winkleman. Hardly a replacement, but at least he was willing to help. We ate lunch together every day, and I found myself honestly looking forward to that regular meeting where Hugh could explain things to me. It's obvious, he said. She's in love with you. I don't even know who she is. I hadn't learned more than 15 or 20 names at that point. Hugh was disgusted. Typical. I've spent my whole life in this dumb town, and I've never gotten a girl to give me a second look. And here you have someone named Lorelei throwing herself at you? You can't let that slip through your fingers. Ask her to the Halloween dance. What's a Halloween dance? Only the most important social event of the school year. Not that I've ever been to one. His eyes narrowed. If you're 8th grade president, shouldn't you know about it? I hope not, I said worriedly. Hugh looked dubious. Well, you probably shouldn't go by me. It's not exactly Mr. Pop- I'm not exactly Mr. Popularity around here. But I think the president plans the whole shindig. Refreshments, decorations, music... Something tingled directly behind the peace sign I wore around my neck. I was developing a sixth sense for when trouble was coming my way. But what good was advance warning? Advance warning of what? I wasn't going to understand it anyway. Maybe that was my mistake. Even trying to understand. Garland was so simple. Seven acres of land containing exactly one house, one barn, a vegetable garden, fruit trees, and a pickup truck. And only one other person. Maybe in a place as complex as C average middle school, it was impossible to analyze every single thing that happened. Like, what were those little white paper balls that I kept brushing out of my hair every night? Was there so much paper in a school that the molecules eventually clustered and fell into precipitation? And how did a pickled brain and all those other weird objects get into my locker? I thought the whole point of a lock was that no one could open it but me. I sure never put pink goo in a dead bird in there. Rain always recommended meditation for stress and confusion, but if you meditate in front of your locker, someone might steal your sandals while your eyes are closed. I had to go home barefoot on the school bus that afternoon. I know complaining is a negativity trip, but it was hard to stay positive about the floor of a school bus. 
It's a collecting place for the filthy, smelly, sticky, and often sharp and jagged cast-offs of a society run wild. If I'd ever questioned why Rain and her friends gave up on city life in San Francisco and founded Garland back in 1967, five minutes on that bus explained it. The dark underbelly of the human animal was turned loose on that vehicle. It was crowded, noisy, dirty, rowdy, and uncomfortable. People fought, shrieked, threw things at one another, and tormented the hapless driver. It was an insane asylum on wheels. By the time I made it to the Donnelly's house, my bruised and bleeding feet were decorated with lollipop sticks, chewing gum, hairs, broken soda can tabs, straws, buttons, and some things I couldn't even identify. To make matters worse, Sophie caught me in the backyard hosing off my feet as, as at the outdoor tap. Nice, she muttered. But the thing is, her expression said she didn't think it was nice at all. Lately, every time I talked to Su Sophie, she looked like she had just eaten some turnips that had been harvested a week too late. Her face twisted into an unpleasant contortion that made it hard to see how beautiful she was. But I tried my best, because I knew about her disappointment over her father and the driving lessons. I realized my good fortune at being raised by Rain, who never broke a promise and never let me down in any way. The more I thought about it, the more I wanted to do something nice for Sophie, to make her feel better. But how could that ever happen? Every time I went near her, she practically bit my head off.